What would New York City be like if we had as many steamy hot days every year as Houston? Or if parts of the FDR Drive, Wall Street, and even Coney Island disappeared on a regular basis due to extensive flooding? And what if we couldn't get away from it all because the entry points to the tunnels, bridges, subway lines, and even airports were themselves underwater? No, this isn't some Hollywood horror movie. It's the warnings being issued by research scientists who specialize in climate change. I'm Sarah Bartlett, and this is our topic today on USA Inc. Joining us today is Peter Goldmark, Director of the Climate Program at Environmental Defense. Peter, thanks for being on the show with us. My pleasure. Let's talk today about global warming and the impact that it could conceivably have on New York City. I'm trying to get people to think about it locally for a minute. Well, I think uh, the two most immediate and understandable impacts on a city like New York that global warming would have are, first of all, as the oceans warm up slightly and rise, and that rising will also be a result of melting of uh, the two great ice sheets in the world on Greenland and the South Pole, there will be a threat of flooding and higher water level on the low parts of the city. Now, everybody listening to us will have their own idea of where the low parts of the city are, but in this kind of city, that is where every borough has either a bay front or a uh, uh, ocean front. Uh, there are a lot of candidates for that. Lower Manhattan is one example. Out on uh, the far Rockaways in Coney Island is another example. The other thing that everybody will notice is that it's more like living in Atlanta or Houston in New York in terms of weather. By that I mean everything will be warmer and a little more humid. Now with that comes many other things that we don't think of right away, such as change in disease rates. But if I had to give you two headlines, I'd say water rises and our children wake up and they're living in Atlanta, not New York. Let's stick with the first one. Let's talk about the water rising. Um, what does that mean in terms of problems for us? Is that a big deal? Do we, do we care if it's flooding every once in a while? Or is there something that we ought to be thinking of more, you know, that we should make it a higher priority to try to address? I think it's wrong to think of it as cataclysmic mm -hmm. in the sense of we'll wake up some morning and, you know, our streets are underwater. Um, it is something one can prepare for and it's something one can anticipate to some degree. Uh, and therefore, there's some very logical things one can do. One can put breakwaters, um, things like the entrances to the tunnels. This is Manhattan is an island linked by bridges and tunnels. Uh, you can take special care about those. And since you're in the subway system in a constant state of repair and rehabilitation anyway, you can begin to take into account the fact, well, where is water going to get into that system? That is an example of a, of a major city asset that you want to make sure isn't affected. So uh, on, on, on the rising sea level and water level one, uh, it can be expensive and it can be difficult, but if we got our wits together, uh, it's not unmanageable. Now, of course, the best way to manage it is to begin to do something about global warming in the first place, because then you also avoid all the large-scale national and international effects, which in the long run in a place like New York are going to be pretty important. We'll come back to that, but let me just stay with this, um, the steps that you outlined that we could do if we had our wits about us. Do we have our wits about us? Is there any sign that we have our wits about us? You know, the answer to that question is no. That's what I was afraid <laughs> you were going to say. What we, would it take? We are not acting like a city or a state or a country that knows there's a big problem coming and it's taking, we are not acting like people who still have some time to do something about it. I mean, I think at the national level, you know, we all have our doubts about the way that politics works in Congress, and there's a certain cynicism that's crept in. But I think in New York City, at least, particularly in the, in the Bloomberg administration, there's been a real emphasis on can-do and sort of business-like and hold us accountable. Uh, isn't it possible that we could be investing money wisely and taking, um, making smart decisions now? 
We could be, but I think the smart decisions the city and state need to take are, first of all, in the investing for the future area. Infrastructure, that kind to, of thing. No, to mitigate global warming and to help this region take advantage of the kind of economy we'll have in a world affected by global warming. Give us what an example. I mean? yeah. We have one of the oldest electric grids in the country. It's inefficient, it's expensive, it's centralized. Now you could save tons of energy simply by financing the reconstruction of the present electric grid. And you could reduce the release of carbon dioxide. The reconstruction of the grid, that sounds so daunting. I mean, that's got to cost billions of dollars and take 20 years. Is that You know, Sarah, I don't, I don't go for daunting. I'll tell you why. <laughs> I was budget director under Hugh Carey when they all told us the city was going down the tubes. And there were some lonely hours, but we did it. We did it by every sector of this city and state coming together. Um, and I can give you some other examples of things we've done in this city and state. So it's not daunting to, uh, you've got time. You've got 5, 10, 15 years to do some of these things. If we get started now. If we get started now. Do you now. sense that the Bloomberg administration, which has taken on lots of big projects and is certainly very ambitious, are they recognizing that this is an issue in, in your work? Do you encounter them? I don't sense that they have a vision of the kind of in infrastructure that will both protect the city in the future and position it in an economically advantageous way. You were chairman of the Port Authority. Do you see anything going on in the Port Authority that uh, would suggest that they're involved? Not today. Not today. Don't see that. Of course, the Port Authority is one of the great economic engines of our region. But I have hope. I'll tell you why. There's an event that is going to happen uh, this coming fall that has not happened in 24 years. And that is you will have new governors in New Jersey and New York together. And when you have new governors together, that's when you get a new mandate for the Port Authority. So if we can sense some change at the state level, that could be a catalyst. Yes, the Port Authority is essentially a creature of, of the two states. Um, but let me give you another example. What is the largest source of clean energy in this country? Wind? It's, no, that's one of the second largest. Solar, one of the second largest. It's energy efficiency because it emits nothing. And it's a huge, you should think of it as a huge bank. Now suppose instead of public authorities and huge state supported uh, operations that just build things, suppose we had a branch of our state public power authority that was an efficiency authority. And they could buy efficiency improvements and finance them from the private sector, from the public sector. That's what I'm talking about, building the kind of infrastructure we're going to need over the next 20 to 25 years. Now, when you do that, you help with the problem, but you also give New York an advantage over everybody else who gets there later. That's the history of New York. When we built the Erie Canal, the rest of the country said we were crazy. But what did it do? It gave New York an unassailable position for 50 years. So New York said it's best when it looks ahead because it can invest and because it does have these large governmental resources and public authorities. But everything I hear is that we've taken on so much debt, we've already got too much invested, we have a capital plan that there's no money for, our schools are crumbling, our bridges need to be rebuilt. How will we take that money and set it aside to make these kinds of investments? Well, I don't buy it that we're too much in debt. I don't see any signs of that. There are a lot of questions about debt. We shouldn't turn this into a program uh, on debt, but you gotta remember, to put it baldly, the use of debt in public finance is a comparative advantage of New York. And the trick is to use it soundly, not to use it unsoundly. If you use it unsoundly, a little bit of debt is a bad idea. If you use it soundly and wisely and shrewdly, a lot of debt can be a good idea. How do you buy efficiency? You talked about an efficiency organization. What, what could it do? Give us some examples. Suppose you're running, uh, I'll use an example of something that emits a lot of greenhouse gases, which is what causes global warming. So we got the Bartlett Cement Company. Making cement happens to emit. Now suppose I'm the, I'm the New York uh, Energy Efficiency Authority. Suppose I come to you and say, you know what I'm gonna do? I am going to finance the changes in your capital plant that will reduce your greenhouse gases by half, and you're gonna pay me back out of your lowered costs and your increased profits. That's what I'm talking about. Now, we've got public authorities going around doing everything, but none of them are doing that. Do you, what do you think the problem is with the recognition of this as an issue? I mean, part of it is just finding the political will to move forward on some of these mm -hmm. ideas. 
I ask myself that a lot because uh, I've just come back two years ago from living in Europe where I was running the International Herald Tribune. So I really learned a lot about how Europeans think. And on the same issues, we're talking about global warming, climate change, which are this, these are abstract issues. The Europeans get it, and we don't. So it is possible for an educated, alert public to get this issue. It's not impossible. So what are some of the differences? All I can do is give you a few candidates out of which people smarter than you and I might make a mosaic. One is, and I was told this by a young schoolgirl, she said, Chernobyl, you don't understand what it did to us to have a nuclear reactor when we were told they were all safe, go off and know that cloud was overhead and know somebody who was exposed to it and wonder if 10 years later they were going to come down with it. So Chernobyl had a huge, it, it, Chernobyl was in some ways their 9-11 in a different field in terms of immediacy and oh my God, the world is not the way I thought it was. Now another example is they, the Europeans live very close to each other. Uh, they're much more densely populated than the United States. I mean, the wide open spaces is not a, that's not a European phrase, that's an American phrase. So when the river's polluted, when there's a stack belching mercury or whatever it is, it's both landing in your backyard. And so you get a much more acute appreciation of when things are going wrong. Do you sense that there's any shift in the sort of political thinking in this country that environmental, um, environmentalism, I guess we should call it, is, is on the rebound, is sort of becoming more and more important in the, in the political world? I, th I think the following, Sarah. I think there are a lot of signs that America is making up its mind on global warming the way Europe did 10 years or so ago. And, you know, the broader issue of environmentalism, that's a tough and complicated subject. But on global warming, you have businesses coming around and saying, we got to do something about this. General Electric, Walmart, how about them apples? <laughs> you think, I mean, that wouldn't have been true three years ago. Right. Most of the utilities, one way or another, were not eager for this. They know it's coming. And you look at what they say, they're not saying, do it to me now, but they're saying, I know we got to do something, and could we please do it intelligently? Um, there's a movement now of Christian evangelicals called the Evangelical Climate Initiative. You think that could have existed three years ago? Not really. I mean, that, that puts the fear of God, excuse the phrase, in the White House. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that is an issue that we're going to have to see whether conservatives embrace this in this country generally. Who is the most popular politician in this country in the polls? You tell me. It's John McCain. He's come out four square to do something about climate change. It's a lesson there. Well, we'll see what happens in the next election. We'll be right back. The Zicklin School of Business at Baruch College of the City University of New York is the largest and most diverse accredited business school in the United States, offering high-quality, full-time and part-time degree programs at the undergraduate, master's and Ph.D. levels. For information about the Zicklin School of Business, please visit our website, zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. That's zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. Welcome back. I'm speaking with Peter Goldmark, Director of the Climate Program at Environmental Defense. One of the initiatives that I believe you're focusing on is to work in China a little bit. Can you tell us what uh, role the Environmental Defense Group would have over there? Well, one of the things uh, we're doing in China is to help some of their regions and cities develop what's called a cap and trade program. Very simply, this is an approach that tries to harness market forces to reducing emissions and pollution. So the way it works is you got the Sarah Bartlett utility and you got the Goldmark utility, and we each have to reduce our emissions 5%, okay? Now, you run a smart, tight operation, you have a modern plant, access to capital to improve it, and you have the best engineers anywhere in the world. So you can not only make your 5%, you can make a 10% reduction. Now my plant is old fashioned, it's rusty, I can't get a loan anywhere, my engineers are drunk all the time, I can't even make my 5%, so what do I do? Under this system, I go to you and buy your excess reduction credits. Now that's a way of using the market 
and their trades, and you see how their prices and their winners and losers. It gets us all rowing in the same direction without a complicated command and control methodology, which doesn't work. You know, that's where they send you 800 page instruction manuals and 14 screws and three screwdrivers and say, Bartlett, install this in your smokestack. Never works, believe me, never works. So we are running an experiment like that in China, unnoticed by almost everybody. So we could call this a tale of two cities, New York City and Shanghai, the two large cities, the, the really the capital cities in terms of commerce and business uh, and the arts in the two largest economies of the world. And these two countries will determine the future of the global warming issue around the globe. So what we're working on is try to make work with the Chinese to develop the systems and the measuring and the monitoring, but also the market-based dynamics so that when they decide to join the international system, as the U.S. will also have to do someday, they already know how to do it. How open are they to this kind of initiative? I mean, do you see much receptivity? Here's the deal. They're very open as long as it's not called anything to do with global warming. So the actual experiment being run is on sulfur dioxide emissions. Why are they so sensitive? They're sensitive because their position is, until the U.S. does it, they won't even consider it. And they, if they were sitting here today and you said to them, why don't you people reduce your emissions, they would say back to you, excuse me, you say there's a problem with global warming and there's too much uh, carbon dioxide in the air? Well, who put it there? Why don't you do We don't have much of a defense <laughs> in that argument. There's virtually no defense. What I mean, we've got to all get there together. But to use that as a sham that the developing countries mm -hmm. aren't doing anything about it now is, is a very hypocritical argument. The developing countries and the developed countries, including the U.S., all agreed together in the 1990s that the first reduction would be made by the North and then we'd all talk together about a joint program. So it's, it's, you know, when you hear people say, well, we can't be part of this system because the Chinese and the Indian, that's really very hypocritical. What is the single um, most important thing you would like to see our government do to try to move this along? I'd like to see our government do one simple thing, which is enact carbon caps with a trading program the way I describe it, because that is a signal to the economy as a whole, to every player, every investor, every emitter, every industry, every city and state. It says there is now a price to emitting greenhouse gases. And the more you reduce it, the better you will do, the more you'll succeed economically. That's how you harness a market. And once you do that, you get the arrows going in the right direction. And then we can have Ten debates about, you know, how, what part of the burden should the Detroit automakers, be, automakers bear? What part should the utilities? But right now, what our national government says is, well, we don't know if there's a problem, but if there is, maybe voluntary measures can do it. That is pure baloney. So that's the first step. Caps with a trading system and get the arrows pointing down rather than up. Only if you get the arrows pointing down will you minimize how high that sea level around the battery is going to rise. Do you um, have any evidence that this kind of system works? I mean, that it really can have an, an impact? Why should we trust what you're saying? Well, we have one in this country. And it was put in 1990 at the recommendation of a president named Bush. And it's a cap and trade different on Bush. <laughs> different Bush on sulfur dioxide from utilities. Now, you know what the utilities said beforehand? They said, this is terrible. We're going to have to lay off thousands of people. There'll be blackouts all over America. The day the law was passed and the president signed it, what did they do? They stopped moaning. They called in their staff. You know what the CEO said? He said, now, we've got to reduce our emissions, and we're going to have to buy them from someone else if we don't. I want you guys to make this a profit center. I want you to set up a task force and figure out how we're going to exceed our goal. The day was passed. And, and what what's happened? happened to sulfur dioxide? Sulfur dioxide has gone down more than anybody predicted because you had all these huge companies working to do it. And all these estimates about the cost and how awful it was done at one-seventh the cost. So why is it so hard to take the next step? I mean, if, it, if you have a microcosm example like that, why not go the next step? Well, we don't have, an, we don't have a president and national administration that wants to take it. Well, Congress is there, too. Uh, Congress is not about to, about to take it until they begin to really understand 
that a lot of people well, want. Well, are you saying that we would need a Chernobyl-like event in this country to um, no, I'm galvanize saying, us? Or? I'm saying what we need is the major sectors of the American political community, including the farmers. Uh, the automakers have to understand something like this is going to happen. They've got to look at the problem and understand it. There's a great book by Jared Diamond called Collapse, and he talks about civilizations that collapsed because they didn't anticipate future difficult trends. This is a trend that is potentially very serious, but we still have time to act on. So it's a, it's a test of our imagination and our will to act without the disaster happening first. And that's, that's the great $64 question, whether we're up to the test. And that's the adventure you and I are in and that our children are in. What about um, the inventiveness of the American spirit, the entrepreneurialism? Why haven't um, market forces generated new energy uh, sources that we could use that wouldn't uh, give off these emissions that would hurt us? Because all the market incentives today are to be wasteful, use oil. We don't have any market incentives to be efficient but or to But the world knows fewer. that we're waiting for uh, some improvement in the situation. I mean, it's not a secret that global warming is upon us and that we need no. to do something. But if you're running a business, you pay attention to what the market tells you and what the price incentives are. You don't pay attention to what some fuzzy thing called world opinion is. And if you're getting tax breaks for drilling oil, if you have no requirements to make your cars more efficient, if you don't have to get the carbon out of the industrial, the Bartlett cement factory, you know, if your incentive is to leave the carbon in there, why should you change? That's our job in the public sector. That's what the public sector is for, is to establish the values and the rules, and then that harnesses the private dynamic. Take, you know, we got let out of gasoline in this country because it was frying kids' brains was bad. You think that happened because the oil companies said, well, I think there's some <laughs> general public opinion. That happened the day the federal government said, get the lead out. We, we confuse sometimes the role of the public and private sector. The, you know what Václav Havel, the, head of, the president of Czechoslovakia, said? He said, the market is an amazing thing. It's a wonderful servant, but it's a poor master. Now, what about states? We've been seeing some state efforts to try mm -hmm. to change the signals to the market. Is that where uh, we might see more political yep. change? That's, and that's one of the ways that you, the United States shows it's changing its mind. There are eight uh, northeastern states that have agreed to put a cap-and-trade system on their utilities. Remember we were talking about right. cap-and-trade? California is debating a cap-and-trade system. California has passed a law that says three years from now, there's a limit on how much carbon dioxide automobiles. And everyone says that the auto companies won't sell their cars there and they'll boycott California. Right. Isn't it funny they say that? <laughs> but isn't it funny that the automakers agreed to those limits with the government of Canada? The ones they the said same, they couldn't? The very same the limits. Very, isn't that a, Interesting. You don't understand. The private sector groans when you're talking about doing something because they want to minimize. As soon as it's done, they move forward. They know what the rules of the game are. So do you see um, state political forces in New York? Um, I mean, you talk about a new governor. Obviously, it's too early to know who that person right. will be. We have John Corzine in New Jersey. But do you see evidence that, um, or, or any signs of hope on that front that New, that New York City will benefit from? I can't tell. You'd really need a, uh, you want the geographic area to be as large as possible. So I think what you'd want, ideally, is a New York state plan in which the city cooperated and was a major participant. There are a number of forms that can take. I have no idea, as you and I sit here, whether that will be part of the gubernatorial campaign. Um, but there is a huge opportunity, Sarah, for New York to take the lead again and be in the cutting edge of what the, what the states do. You remember, you remember all the New Deal legislation that got us out of the recession? You know where Franklin Roosevelt got that? From New York state laws. So perhaps we can be a leader again. Maybe we can do it again. I've been fortunate to have Peter Goldmark, Director of the Climate Program at Environmental Defense, as my guest. Thank you, Peter, for being on the show. Thanks. We'll be right back. Some people think of New York as the world's second home. The City University of New York, with students coming from 90 countries and speaking more than 155 languages, is the world's first university. 
Find us on the web at cuny.edu or call us at 1-800-CUNY-YES. Unfortunately, the debate over global warming has become extremely politicized, but there are practical, logistical issues that need to transcend politics in New York City, and soon. Four of the five city boroughs are islands, and we inhabit 600 miles of coastline. Estimates say that as much as 8% of the entire U.S. population lives in the larger metropolitan region. So when we hear serious, well-intentioned scientists warning us about extensive flooding, dangerous heat conditions, risks of contamination to our water supply, fundamental problems with our evacuation plans, we should take heed. We need to set aside substantial public funds now to invest in strengthening seawalls, installing pumps, and revisiting our evacuation plans so that when disaster strikes, as it almost certainly will, we are better prepared. Of course, we're not nearly as badly off, geographically speaking, as New Orleans. But if we don't try to get ahead of this issue, we could find ourselves looking at similarly devastating film clips on the evening news before too long. Only they will be about us. For USA Inc., I'm Sarah Bartlett.